All right. Welcome to the latest episode of Out of Chicago Live. I'm here with Tony Reynes and Keith French. Welcome, guys. Woohoo! Today, we are talking about a, a hidden landscape photography gem, and believe it or not, it's North Dakota. And I didn't believe it at first either, but it is an amazing place to go shoot. And we've got proof. We've got photos today that we'll be showing off from both Tony and Keith, and uh, they're going to talk all about the place. So um, the idea is that, you know, the problem with landscape photography is you go out and you're like, oh, I want to be out in nature. I want to be alone. And then all of a sudden you are with hundreds of other photographers if you go to one of these big national parks or whatever. And, and, and yeah, it's the same place like Tony would say, Ansel Adams has been there. Everyone's been there. Everyone shot it. Well, we found somewhere new for you. Uh, and that is uh, the state of North Dakota. So um, let's start by introducing Tony and Keith. So Tony, tell us a little bit about your background in photography and uh, how that kind of led you eventually to North Dakota. Go for it. I think I started getting really serious about photography uh, around 2000, 2001, when I got my first digital point and shoot and found out I could shoot as much as I wanted for no money. And you do. You do shoot. <laughs> I'm not known as machine gun for nothing. He uses this uh, spray and pray technique, and he does a great job with it. Yeah. Um, I think in the first two years, I went through three point and shoots, and then I got my first DSLR. Uh, it was the uh, 5D. I mean, the, the 10D. Dang. Um, I also decided I was going to learn Photoshop, so I dove into that. And uh, Tony is my Photoshop guru. He's the one that taught me everything I know. Thank you, Tony. Very good. I've taken lessons right there, right next to Tony in his office there. Uh, he's excellent. Um, keep going, Tony. Uh, <laughs> as I said, just like home, inter interrupt back and forth. Uh, normal. Uh, after that, uh, about five years later, I started uh, getting even more serious and I started teaching Photoshop and I started selling some stuff on the side and about six years ago i got real serious and started uh doing business to business photography uh, doing re a real estate a real estate work and then also selling wall art um, and then when my company folded in the great recession uh, i went full-time into this venture so i've been doing it full-time now for about four or five years and your favorite subjects have always been the barns, the lighthouses, yes. the things that, yeah, yes. things that maybe, uh, you know, not everyone is always out looking for, especially the barns and, uh, and dilapidated barns and everything. But that's always been your thing, right? And rust. And rust, uh-huh. <laughs> yeah, and kind of Americana, you might say, yeah. too, right? That's and true. That's, and that's what led us into uh, North Dakota. So let's save that for a second. Let's introduce Keith. Tell us your background with photography, just quick. Yeah, so I started uh, shooting in 1985 when I was still in the military. It was just a hobby. Um, I knew I was going to be going to some cool places. I thought I should get a camera to record that. Didn't realize, you know, that fast forward 15 years later, I'd end up buying a camera store, leaving the corporate world, and running a, a, a retail camera store with a photo studio and a, and a commercial film lab. Um, you know, selling equipment, accessories, teaching classes, and doing that whole camera store thing uh, until, you know, 2011 hit. And I loved the teaching part of it. So a couple of my buddies said, you ought to start doing workshops. And then another guy came up with an idea and he's like, you know, Southern Illinois is a great place. And it's kind of like starved rock on steroids minus the crowds. And so again, you know, you know, Starve Rock is 90 minutes away from about 3 million people. Southern Illinois is about uh, four hours away from St. Louis, and that's the biggest metroplex near there. So uh, what a great place to start doing workshops. Um, my thing with photography is I never really found the one item I really love to shoot. So every chance I got since 1985, I was always learning something new, whether it was people, products, landscape, um, airplane to airplane, airplane to ground, you name it. Um, I've tried a lot of it and I love it and enjoy it. And so, and uh, after I closed the store, I stayed full time in the commercial photography and I do basically advertising and marketing photography, business to business. Nice. So both Tony and Keith have taught at our conferences in the past. They're going to be teaching, uh, they're going to be leading uh, photo walks at the summer conference this summer. 
June 23rd through the 25th, sign up, and they will, uh, out of Chicago.com, and they will be uh, leading a whole bunch of workshops for out of Chicago. We're going to talk about those, but today we're talking about North Dakota. And to me, it's like, you know, we said you go to these places and there's millions of people there. And then you get this idea in your head. You're like, oh, I'm going to go somewhere where like no one would go. I'm going to go to Iceland. And it's like, <laughs> oh, everyone's there. Ah, now where do I go? So, yeah, and it's more expensive. <laughs> yeah, well, for sure. So how can we find a place that where there's going to be no one else? And uh, we're going to get amazing images that other people don't have. And uh, that's what's so intriguing about this uh, adventure that we're talking about. So, Tony, talk to us about how you came about finding North Dakota in the first place. Uh, not, not that you discovered. I mean, it, I mean, it was always there. It was there. Yeah. It was uh, also on my map of a state I'd never been to. Uh, driving back from the Palouse, um, I went through North Dakota, and I was struck by how similar it was, uh, except much, much bigger. Uh, came back and that sat in my head for a year or two and then for some strange reason I said let's get serious about this and uh, there was very little information on it except for one website and the website didn't give you very much location information so I ended up probably between 14 and 18 hours working on the website and then using Google Earth to verify if things still existed. And one of the major problems Keith and I found is we have to go up and check it out each time before we bring people up there because we don't know if it's burned down, it's been blown down, or the people have stolen the wood. <laughs> yeah, so, so things are constantly changing out there. Uh, but, but that's what makes it special, too, is, is some of these things that maybe won't be there for much longer are there right now. So you kind of got to uh, take advantage while it's there. Well, hopefully you're going to be showing uh, an image of a church, Keith and I. Eh, maybe we I got have... a couple. I got a few churches in here. I got a list okay, of okay. Uh, I got, got some of my favorites. Uh -huh. uh, Keith was talking to the person that owned the land. Hey, Keith, you tell a story. Oh, okay. So we were on this gate because it was in the middle of a, uh, a horse pasture. This big old, you know, single steeple church probably sat 60, 80 people at one time. And, um, and so we're, we're looking at, at this building from a distance and up drives this lady in a pickup truck. And yeah, I put up the right image, by the way. What's that? I can't see anything. Oh, you don't see my screen? Nope. Hmm. Well, let's no. just pretend you do. All right, tell the story. <laughs> I see part of Lightroom Band. Anyway, so so this lady, she originally thought we were hunters, but we weren't dressed right, and we didn't have uh, guns. We had cameras. So and tripods. She's, and tripods. She's like, what are you guys doing? And I says, well, we're, we're taking pictures of this beautiful church. There oh, it is. yeah. Isn't that gorgeous? And That's so, the one, right? so she's, like, yeah. she's like, you know, this thing is just a real pain. She said, uh, we're getting ready to burn it down. And then I did not to, but I haven't convinced myself not to. It's full of raccoons. Well, we're afraid that this is probably shot with a 200, right? That was one of your images. Um, and so but we're far enough away, we can't tell there's raccoons in there. But against that dark gray sky, we had a, a few of those over there. It's just a really thing. And that's not the original site it was built on. It was built in town. And I, I think she said something like 40, 50 years ago, they moved it to that property for a, a, a barn, the more or less, a, you know, barn usage, animal storage and hay storage. And, but uh, what a beautiful building that was. So, yeah. Was, so, so yeah. churches, barns, old Great elevators, green elevators. Green elevators. Yeah. Um, Those towns, yeah. one-room schoolhouses. Yeah, and it's things that uh, you just don't see everywhere. Um, and and I agree about what you're saying about the Palouse. Of course, you're missing the rolling hills and all that. But yeah, go ahead, Tony. Well, actually, there are rolling hills. Uh, uh, North Dakota has an interesting terrain. Uh, if you go from the northeast to the southwest, it goes from flat farmland where you could probably fit 10 Midwestern farms into one of these big wheat fields on over to the other side and you have rolling hills and then you actually have a badlands. Mm -hmm. 
So we're going to go through some more of these images here. So people get an idea of what they might see. Um, you guys like all the bags in the background here? So I am working on, uh, I'm going to do a review rather than like 15 reviews. I have, right? Like women collect shoes. We collect camera bags. Yeah. Yeah, <laughs> like 15 yes. I think I have a few more in the garage. So, uh, so I'm working on doing a, a video review for the YouTube channel here. I'm going to go through all the bags, which ones are my favorites and why, and different ones are better for different things, right? But uh, we'll put that up. So make sure you are subscribed to the Out of Chicago YouTube channel and uh, click the subscribe button, click the little bell so you're notified when it comes up again, and uh, and give a thumbs up to the video. So anything else you guys want to say real quick before we get into some pictures here? Go ahead, Kia. Tell them how you got convinced to go. <laughs> so, so the background here is that, is that Tony, Tony loved North Dakota. He's been showing us his pictures for the last few years now. And, um, and then you guys together did a workshop last year and uh, kind of like just check it out, bring a few people out, and you guys are going to be offering another workshop uh, coming up later this year. What, what are the dates on that? Do you have it in front of you? Yeah, it's going to be May 20th through May 26th. So yeah. it's a Sunday through Friday. So you're going to have to fly out there uh, into Bismarck, and then we will meet you there. We'll already be there three days scoping it out, making sure that it did blow over, burn down. Plus, there's several new sites we need to check out because we have a local Intel source that literally spends the, the week on the road recording things for us and telling us where they're at. So we want to check some of them out to incorporate them. Um, but so, so how did Tony convince me? Well, he's like, hey, I'm going to go to North Dakota and do a photo workshop. He says, you, you, you need to come up there and come with me because you're going to really love this place. And I'm like, Tony, I've flown over North Dakota. There's nothing there except ice. <laughs> of course, I was there in January, and it's incredibly cold in Minot in January, but that's when I was there. So he showed a few pictures to me, and, you know, I'm not a big barn guy. I'm not a big old church guy, I didn't think. And then after I saw, you know, half a dozen of these pictures, I'm like, Tony, this could be an incredible opportunity to teach people some really cool techniques one-on-one, -on -one, regardless of of what's there because we'll have so much time on our hands to really give them individual instruction. And so, so we weren't planning on making a workshop out of the first trip. It was just going to be Tony and I and just our little circles of influence because who, who can't talk about things that are fun before we know it, there's four people that want to come with us. So off we went. What a trip. Look at that place. Isn't that cool? All um, right. What are we looking at here? This was the town of Belfort in North Dakota. This was one of two churches. I think the population is like 27. So I don't know where on earth they, they go to both one at a time. I don't know. But uh, this was the church on the North end and uh, you know, beautiful place. Stunning. I love the stonework on the, on the staircase, the textures in the wood, um, a lot of hand mill work I, w I bet went into this building. And then as we um, circled around and photographed this from all angles, you can really not only see the incredible craftsmanship, but then you stand back and set this image into the into the cityscape or the landscape, if you will. And you know, this was like the the twenty minutes of the week we were there. We had a blue sky. So, <laughs> <laughs> it's, what what he means by that was a plain blue sky. We had amazing clouds. Yes. The other thing I'd also talk about, if you look down to the left hand side, you see that there is nothing on the horizon. <laughs> yeah. Well, and, and the three of us went out yesterday, actually, and we were recording um, an episode for the podcast, which will go up in the next week or so. Um, make sure you sign up for the podcast also at outofchicago.com. But, um, but we were looking at barns and stuff in the area, some of them that you did on your workshop after the winter tour, and you were saying your tip was you got to find a, a barn or a building that is isolated and not cluttered with everything around it. And so that's exactly what you're talking about, is that, that you're going to find that everywhere here. You know, interestingly enough, Chris, uh, I guess I've never said this before, but to a degree, if you look at the church, that's the main actor. That's what's on the stage. And what you're trying to do is surround it with as little scenery as possible for it to stand out. Yeah, well, and that's what you got to do with any photograph. What's your main subject and make sure that stands out and it's very clear what it is and obvious what it is there. Same here. What am I looking at here? 
Go ahead, Pete. Uh, um, this was near a railroad track and a gravel road, and I bet there probably was a grain elevator nearby at one time that blew over. But this is what's left of one of three buildings uh, at what was probably a town. I think actually on one of our maps, Tony, that gave that area a name. Um, yeah, it was. Yeah, so so this is what's left of, a, of an old west town, if you will. Um, I don't know if this was a resident or a business or what, but you know, you can, again, multiple angles, take a look at this, you get incredible lighting, regardless of, you, you can see the cloud cover was pretty thick, but there were a lot of breaks in the cloud, and they were moving fast. So with a, a technique using a, a wide angle and a neutral density filter, you can get some uh, slower shutters and kind of drag them clouds through the picture and kind of get that big grandiose look of, of the clouds coming out of the middle of the picture and, and working their way to the edges. And uh, the tall grass, that was green grass, and it was probably, I don't know, 10 to 15 inches tall. Just It just had a cool look to it, very cool look. The other thing that was really neat about it was the fact that you could get into all of these buildings and you could shoot from either the outside or the inside. And it was sort of like going into a large house. The, um, the whole area had enough space so each photographer could sort of go off in their own direction and do their own thing. Mm -hmm. Probably one of the biggest issues Keith and I have when we lead a group is to have everyone practice camera etiquette. So you start from way out and you move in closer so you don't have your soon to be no longer friend standing in front of your lens when you have a great shot. <laughs> you know, I'd probably be doing I'm... selfies in the doorway. That's probably what I'd be doing. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no. no. Not everybody is kind of a big landscape, big picture photographer. Some of them just want to get up close to these boards and shoot the texture, you know, or, or get inside the building and use the window as a frame and shoot something, another building through the window. And it's like, oh, hold on, hold on, you know, look behind you. There's still some people shooting this. And they're like, okay, sorry, you know. And they the kind other of thing, you know, everybody's pattern. The other thing that's sort of neat is with the winters as severe as they are and the summers as short as they are, uh, you don't run into critters of any sort. Uh, the only things we run into in these buildings typically are uh, barn swallows. So uh, there's, there's no worry about other things. There was a big owl in one of the barns. Yes, scared hell out of us. Yeah, it uh, was a moment of excitement. <laughs> That's another way to say it. So here's one of the grain elevators, is that right? Yes. That's... Um, before I went up there, Chris, that was sort of the quintessential shot I wanted to get of any shot up there. Um, railroad tracks, nice sky, and the texture of the building. And uh, this was off in a valley by itself. What would you say, Keith? We which, spent which valley was this in? <laughs> um, Lens Valley. <laughs> oh, okay. All right. <laughs> Continue. Well, say, Keith, we probably spent about three hours here. Um, yeah, we were here for quite a while. Um, we did some video here as well. Uh, we, we toured it. This one had access to the inside, and it was fairly safe feeling. It didn't feel like the floor was going to drop out under you. So, um, yeah, we did uh, at least two to three hours in that, that location. And, and And the other nice thing was that because of the train tracks being the proximity they were with the sun, we were able to use the tracks as leading lines. You can go to the other side, and there were some entryways that gave us some nice focus points. So it's a good place. All right. Lunds, Lunds Valley. Yeah. What do we got here? Probably one of Tony's trip, the first trip. Probably one of 50 different churches that we encountered along the way. And I, I think more than anything else, uh, we were driving along and we, we almost had an accident with on a two lane highway with only one car that was on the highway with us. Pulled over to the side and believe it or not, there was a bunch of farm machinery right below where the, uh, the frame shows. And uh, it took them jiggering around to get it right. But the, the sky was just magnificent and uh, it was moving very quickly and for this one, I didn't want to fest uh, a blurred sky, so I, I shot it quickly. And it, it, 
it came out equally well in black and white and color. I, I, I think Keith and I found, what, what would you think, Keith? 60% of our shots we processed into black and white? Oh, yeah. For me, it might even be a little higher. Um, I do like the fine art side of it. And when you've got, you know, it may not be the right term, but I call these angry skies. And when you got these kind of angry skies and, you know, and you shoot it with the right filter or neutral density filter or polarizer, you just get an amazing tonal range just in the skies alone. Um, but I love flipping some of this stuff to black and white, or even uh, you know that sepia tone look too. Right, that, that kind of the period. Most of these buildings were built, you know, in the early eight or nineteen hundred to nineteen twenty. So, you know, the, it wouldn't be unusual to see these in a sepia tone print. So, well, that's, that's what I was see. one of the few buildings that was maintained to t to this day. Yeah, your subject matter is stuff that could have been shot back when there was only black and white films. So, I mean, it makes sense that you're shooting it that way. Yep. Yep. I like it. Ooh, another black and white. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, this was um, my first trip there, and the wind, Keith and I talked about the wind never quitting. Um, this day when I was at this building, it probably was blowing a steady 25, maybe 40 in gusts. And it was one of those deals where you ha almost had to sit on the tripod to keep the, the camera steady. Uh, we had an opportunity of going into this building and we sort of looked at one another and said, probably not a good idea. <laughs> All right. I think there were some ruby slippers hanging out underneath that one. <laughs> That's what I keep thinking. It's like the Wizard of Oz. <laughs> this guy gave up, as you could tell. <laughs> he, he not only gave up, he left. <laughs> so, yeah, Elvis left um, the building. <laughs> yeah. You know, what I like about this is this just really kind of gives you the grandiose landscape. I mean, you, you know, from from a standing height, you should be able to see about four miles of the horizon. And if you look at this, there's one building in the building, and it's in the foreground, more or less. There's nothing else out there. As far as you could see, it's, it's either um, forest or wide open field. And uh, at some point, I believe to our left, there was a rail, a rail bed. And that's how these people stay alive out there. This house had been empty, I would guess, 40 years, easy. And this really reminds me of what Tony always says with these types of photos. You see something like this, and this one's especially, you know, makes you think, what, who lived here? What yes. were they doing? Why did they leave? Like there's a whole story behind it and you kind of got to figure out, make up your own story for it almost. And sometimes we were, I mean, just, you know, things in the car to keep, uh, to keep the, the, the moment in your head. You just kind of say, oh, gee, I really wonder, did you notice the chalkboard in that room? I wonder if they were teaching school or if this was wow. their own school. Or, you know, just yeah. things like that. And, and yeah, that tended to be after. When they left, I'm sorry, what? That tended to be after we ran through all of the Mel Brooks movies. Well, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we, we, if nothing else, we certainly have a lot of fun on these trips. That's <laughs> um, Chris, the, the only other comment I'll make about this image was as I walked back, all of a sudden I said, I can't believe someone left. <laughs> Hang on. Tony's got a call coming in. Dance party. It's going. <laughs> you can't believe someone left, Tony? I can't believe someone left that lawnmower right there. Oh, right. <laughs> this, yeah, there it goes. It's probably a craftsman. <laughs> yeah, do you try and start it up? No. No. Uh, th this was probably one of the two most beguiling churches I saw in North Dakota. Um, Directly behind me were two very big grain elevators, and to camera to, to my left was the house that I think the uh, uh, the reverend stayed in that parish this church. Uh, as you got closer and closer to the church, swallows kept coming out, and you can see some of them. There were so many of them at one point, it was almost like gnats flying around the place. Uh, and, and this is a very, um, th this is probably about a three second 
uh, actually, no, this was not, this was uh, no neutral density filter because the clouds were moving so fast that day that I didn't want to get them any longer and I wanted to be the, the viewer to be able to see the birds. This was one of the pictures Tony sent me from his first trip when he was attempting to convince me that it wasn't just um, Ice Age, the movie up in North Dakota. <laughs> and, uh, and so I, I was like, wow, look at that. You know, so I thought, hey, there's some potential here. Well, that was the understatement of the year. So yeah, I, it was a cool place, very cool place. We saw this one in black and white, right? Right. Yes. The same one, right? Love yeah. that image. Wow. <laughs> This, this is why you wonder why they have strong building codes. <laughs> Actually, that we were shooting that building, and when we started shooting it, it was upright, and this wind came. <laughs> no. <laughs> Don't misguide people. There, no. there was one day that we were up there. I was trying to do about a seven-second exposure to get the clouds movement because they were little popcorny clouds, and they looked cool. But the wind was so strong that even bear hugging my tripod and putting all of my weight on it, the pictures are still blurry. <laughs> wow. Or maybe I'm just shaking it too much. I don't know. <laughs> so the only shots they came out were, were, the, were the quick shutters. Uh, that, believe it or not, was the very first shot I ever took of uh, North Dakota. Uh, this was a uh, grain elevator, and this is over near Pembina which is way, way up in the northeast corner of the state. And the sky was that color. Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah, some of our most interesting shots were probably within 100 miles of the Canadian border. Hmm. Yeah. This was another one of those churches that was well-maintained, absolutely in the middle of nowhere. Um, just someone decided that they were to maintain this building and keep it and they did a really nice job. And um, I think though, Tony, this this was still your first trip, right? Because when we yeah. were here the second time, we had a little bit nicer weather. Well, not only that, but uh, it, it was sunny and that's where all of the deserted farm implements and, and that's where you got that wonderful shot of the truck. Oh yes, yeah, the target practice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I did go through, there were a bunch of other shots of, of old cars, trucks, uh, all sorts of details and stuff. I don't know, my eye just went to these kind of the grand landscape ones like you were saying, Keith, but uh, all that stuff is there, right guys? Yes. Well, you know, there's a lot of people, like I said, that really like to take detailed photography and, you know, they see that old rusty truck and they're right on it, you know, and they're going to take a picture of just the license plate or a headlight or you know, just down the side or a running board of a, a 1930s something pickup truck. And, and it's kind of neat because they litter the landscape probably sounds more uh, frequent, but they're out there. You can't miss them. Chris, do you have any shots uh, of, of the asylum? Mm, well, let me look here. You guys talk about it and I'll look. Go, Keith. So, so the asylum is more or less a campus. It used to be at one point a, a federal hospital. And I believe early on it was for the treatment of smallpox and then they treated that. And, and the hospital, because it was federal property, they decided to turn it into an insane asylum. Um, so it had like the, the residence quarters for probably the, the top guy that ran it. It was a beautiful old house, um, stone and brick and, and beautiful wood inside. And of course, these buildings, it's a campus of about six buildings. They've been stripped of just about everything useful, but it gives you this real urbex, which is urban exploration kind of a location because you've got the, where the beds were, the, the big hospital, five or six stories, solid as a rock. I mean, the floors are solid. The, the staircases are solid. I didn't try the elevator. I'm sure I wouldn't. There weren't any there. <laughs> no, that's probably somebody stole them. But, um, there were so it's cool because you know, you've got you've got trees growing through windows you've got trees coming up through the cracks in the floors of the of what used to be the residence location with the wood floors then you've got the power plant building you've got the the the, the sick bay building um some other buildings we didn't even go to but as tony put in one of his emails you kind of felt like you were on the set of the shining <laughs> you know just <laughs> 
So it wasn't like scary creepy. It was just kind of creepy creepy. It's creepy. <laughs> yeah, the uh, we have permission this time around to go into the building again. It's uh, it's on the uh, reservation, and we also have permission to go into a boarded up 100 year old multi story hotel and we have a chance to go into a boarded up uh, movie house uh, that even has its own popcorn machine that's still there yep. wow so we said this yesterday on the podcast you know that's uh urban exploration but if we're going through barns it's what is it keith barn x barn x <laughs> tony's got really good barn dar he's trying <laughs> to Barn, barn. <laughs> Tony's got great radar for any barn. That's true. The barn dog. So yeah, you'll have to listen to the podcast. It's very good. Um, you know, I don't have the pictures right here of the asylum, but people can picture it, and uh, we'll put some. I think we've got some on the website. So if you're interested in going to North Dakota with these guys, uh, you go to outofchicago.com. We're going to have a link there. It's going to have all their workshops. So let's talk about what other workshops do you guys have coming up. Um, uh, the rest of this year, because it's not just North Dakota. Uh, we have, go Keith. Well, the first one that's coming up close in uh, just under two weeks or just over two weeks is the Lake Michigan uh, Lighthouses workshop on the Wisconsin side. So we're going to start in the Racine area, work our way up to Northern Door County on a Friday, Saturday, Sunday, three days, two nights, great time. Um, Tony's been on this a lot. I've done a lot of work in Door County in the dead of winter. So we're going to kind of combine our two expertise areas and, and really have a good time. Again, a lot of one-on-one, -on -one, a lot of pointers, a lot of show me, tell me, how do I use my gear? So it's going to be a good workshop. And then, and then what, two weeks after that, Tony is our one day. Your turn. <laughs> the, uh, the one we're going to do on, uh, the Michigan side, Chris, is pretty much a copy of the one you and I did last year, uh, where we start down at St. Awesome. Joe mm -hmm. and go all the way up to Point Betsy. Uh, the lake will be a little bit higher than last year, so we may have to adjust things a little bit, but the construction should be done uh, uh, halfway up um, in Grand Haven. Grand Haven. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's going to be a good thing. Uh, and each each one of the lighthouses is different enough so you really get an idea of architecture and my two favorites are little sobble and big sobble and they're totally uh accessible uh and if you hit the uh, right day uh, of the week or weekend you can even climb up them yep nice. yep no those were awesome and you're going to indiana right What's, yeah, in between the two of those is our one-day workshop up here in uh, McHenry County, which is the barn tour um, like we did for winter after the Out of Chicago Winter Conference. This will be different barns, same county. Um, excited to do that one, too, because you know, we, we had some great participants on the last one. And then we made some friends with, with barn owners that invited us in. So um, they, uh, we're trying to mix it up because we don't want to go back to the same place. But... When you have inside access, then you can really mix it up and get some more variety out of a shot. The uh, When you said Indiana, Chris, uh, Keith and I got back, what, two weeks ago yep. from Indiana? Yes, we did. We were down in Park County for two days, and I think we went to 30 covered bridges. Yeah. It was a bunch. And uh, two days. the interesting thing about it was the actual – Covered bridges are a little bit cookie cutter in terms of their construction, but in terms of their length, in terms of the surrounding foliage, and then the difference about what they look like from the river bottom makes each one unique. And we think we picked up probably the best winners um, to go down and see. Mm -hmm. Awesome. All right. I asked you guys to bring doodads. As landscape photographers, what are your favorite landscape photography doodads, gadgets? What do you got? Keith, you're first. Well, mine's a little more than a gadget. It's kind of a gadget all grown up. Oh, I can't yeah. imagine shooting my, uh, my landscapes without my, uh, my, my 17 millimeter tilt shift. You know, this is, uh, here we go, here we go, there she is. Look at that thing. You know, this is like four pounds of metal and glass. Got that giant bulbous dome on it. 
Um, I understand they don't drop well, though. Is that right? No. Yeah. This one, it was it was a beautiful thing until I dropped it. Yes. <laughs> That's not good. Well, um, you know, originally I bought this because I do a lot of architect photography uh, for, for companies, but I'm not out on a landscape very long before I pull this out and start using it to get my verticals perfect and get that big, big picture, that grandiose look of, of, of a nice 17 millimeter on a full frame. So nice, nice tool. Um, but yeah, not a gadget. I, I, I think a gadget has to be under $200. Right? All right. All right. That's fair. <laughs> yeah, that is definitely over $200. <laughs> There's a little zero after there somewhere. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. But uh, all right, you, you're, you're next, Tony. Share one of yours. Because I dropped my lens cap. This is a uh, Kenko Telextender, a 1.4. Yes. Uh, it fits into my camera bag. It's not heavy. And all of a sudden, if I'm carrying five lenses, I now have 10 lenses. And uh, I find it really useful virtually on anything except. I don't think I've ever tried it on my fish eye. Chris, have you? No. <laughs> I think it defeats the purpose. Yeah, um, I'm sure. <laughs> I, I, I think the more time you spend in the field, less and less you want to carry. I think Galen Rowell was probably the biggest proponent of that. So this is my way of getting around carrying extra lenses. Yeah. yeah. Yep. That's awesome. Yeah. And, and then Keith and I have exactly one other doodad that we both carry and that is a set of uh, ND filters uh, usually three of them uh, a three a four and a ten is that what you have Keith yeah here's my ten see it lets in no light it's, like, <laughs> it's just reflection <laughs> yeah, yeah the, ten, the ten you have to put you have to focus first and sometimes you have to literally tape your your focus ring down and then screw on your 10 stop neutral density right because if you bump it a little bit your focal points out but you know being an old film guy um for those youngsters that was a gelatin in their mind this is a graduate neutral density filter these were really important when you were shooting slides and you didn't have photoshop to darken your skies or to darken your foreground so you would put this in front of your lens and slide it up and this is a small this is a minor one this is only about a two stop neutral density graduated you know, you can bring in, in from the side or from the top or from the bottom and try to give your light meter a, a, an opportunity to really win when you had really bright skies or really bright water reflecting back at you. The, the graduated neutral density did a nice job for you. So, so you don't use that anymore? You, you use Lightroom Photoshop now? Well, I'll, I'll pull it out. I mean, it's in my kit. Um, you know, I, I'd rather shoot than work on the computer, so... Anything that keeps me behind the camera more. Um, I do have another fun one that I, I keep with my neutral density filters. Uh, I used to sell these all the time in the camera store. These are colored polarizers. This one is actually a magenta blue. And when you when you spin it, you can you can kind of see some of the colors shifting in there. And yeah, it's totally. really cool. Like right now, as I'm looking through it, everything's red. And when I tilt it, there's everything goes to blue. So it's it's a really cool filter. Sure. These are made by Koken way back in the day, but when they did them for the Hasselblad, because these were the P-series, they went, they went in the front of my Hasselblad, they actually made them out of glass, not the high optical resin. So these are, you know, these, you can't hear it, but these are really, really good filters. They're hard to find, but if you find them, they're worth paying the 30 or 40 bucks. Uh, I, I guess. Yellow and a, and a magenta purple and a magenta blue and regular polarizer. I guess the other uh, thing I'd add is I've owned a couple of ND filters, and if you buy a cheap one, you're going to end up with uh, the potential of a color shift. Yes. Not to mention sharpness. Yeah. Yeah, I have the Sigma, uh, the new Sigma 8514, which has an 86 filter ring. And, you know, the filters that I'm willing to put on the front of them start at, like, $300. Like, yeah. Yeah. Maybe, um, maybe you don't need it for that one. No, not really. This is another fun little toy. Um, I actually got the idea from the guy you guys know as Tony Reynes. He had one on his keychain. But this is my headlamp with a red lens in it. 
um, you find yourself in the evening, maybe out doing lighthouses or sunset, sunrise, and you want to look inside your camera bag or see the back of your camera, you turn on a white light, there goes your light discipline and you just lost your night vision. So um, this little booger, you know, so I can look really crazy and cyclop cyclopsy or uh, maybe even look like a little bit of a serial killer. So I got- yeah, I was in one of those insane asylums and I saw you come around the corner. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But this one got a Cabela's. It's if you hold it down, the red turns to white, so it can be a white light at the same time or red. So it's a nice little light. I think I paid thirty-five bucks for it. Chris, I think the reason that uh, the two of us are sensitive to this is we've both been in the service, and you're very aware at night that if you have white light, you've lost your night vision for a couple of minutes, and using red, uh, it gives you enough light to do your work and still have pretty much retain your night vision. Yeah, actually, believe it or not, it takes about 30 minutes to get back to where you were if you had complete night vision. Really? 30 minutes, wow. it's a long time. Yeah. yeah. The little right. things you remember from 30 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> it's good. All right, so Totally looking forward to seeing uh, your next set of images from North Dakota and from all these other things you have uh, coming up. Go to outofchicago.com. You'll find information on all of those. Uh, like, Tony, what's your uh, personal site if people want to check out some of your work? NorthShoreDigitalPhotography.com. Okay, and we'll put a link on in the uh, description here of the YouTube video. And Keith, how about for you? KFrenchPhoto.com. Come. All right. Very good. We'll have links to both of those and uh, look forward to seeing you guys at the summer conference and uh, around and on the podcast and everywhere else. So uh, a couple of great guys, Tony, Keith, thank you so much for doing this. Thank uh, you. This was great. All right. Absolutely. We will see you in North Dakota. All right. Thanks everyone for joining. Don't forget to subscribe. Don't forget to click a bell. Don't forget to give a thumbs up. Don't forget to do all those things. And um, yeah, I'm going to review all these bags. So make sure you subscribe. It's going to be great. And lots of other adventures. All right. Bye-bye. See you everyone. Bye. Remember how to turn this off. All right. There it is.